Well, I think it is very fitting that the church has us celebrating Divine Mercy Sunday right after Easter when Jesus is appearing to the very disciples who betrayed him, denied him, and abandoned him to crucifixion and death. And he does it today, he appears to them today, giving them the grace of peace, that eternal peace that nothing can take away. Breathe out the Holy Spirit on them, despite their continued unbelief after his resurrection. <laughs> Unless I put my finger into the trace of the nail, the hole on the side, I will not believe, says one of the disciples, Thomas Didymus. Didymus, as you rightly proclaim, means the twin. We are the twin. We represent that twin. We are the twins, if you like, of Thomas, um, of St. Thomas, Thomas Didymus. Especially those of us who think we are academic, we're in the school of theology. We look at the resurrection stories. We say, how come Mary did not recognize Jesus at the tomb and thought he was a gardener? How come those, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus chatted with him and they didn't recognize him? How come he's going through walls and closed doors? As in today's gospel, you see a ghost. We look at the resurrection appearances and we start finding all the incoherence. We are effectively saying sometimes, unless I see evidence, I will not believe. And this is despite 2,000 years of hindsight that you have seen the work of the Spirit of Jesus in establishing the greatest, or maybe you might not say it's the greatest, but I think it's the greatest institution, but definitely the most long-lasting institution in human history, the church. Despite our awareness and experience of the fruits of the Spirit, we still doubt. So let's not be too critical of Thomas Didymus, our twin brother, yeah? because they had more reason to doubt because the Messiah they were expecting is not a Messiah to be crucified. Hmm? I know we read uh, the Messiah is to suffer, but you will not find anywhere in the Old Testament where it says the Messiah is to suffer. No, it's not true. It's a later reading with the, the suffering servant, but the suffering servant is not the Messiah. The Messiah is from the root of David. He's the powerful one who will come and deliver his people. And Jesus seems to fit that model. And they put their trust in him that it, this would be the Messiah. So crucifixion was not part of it. Then all of a sudden, he's crucified. So they even have more reason, you know, to doubt. You know, because this is not what they were expecting. And in his human nature, this was not, this is not what Jesus was expecting. Now, I know I'm speaking in a school of theology and their ears and eyes <laughs> for me to analyze this. Um, I think, you know, so let me be precise. I think in his human nature, Jesus would have loved his people to accept his message, his charisma, his message of the kingdom and build the kingdom build a community of love that we saw in the first reading, perfect first reading, a perfect community, post-resurrection community. Build that community. Who would have expected that? Not brutal crucifixion, betrayal, abandonment, bleeding before his blessed mother. So at a human level, I think Jesus would have expected a more successful you know, um, outcome to his mission. Of course, he said, Father, 
not according to my will, but your will. But I will even go further. I do not think it was the will of God that Jesus should be so brutally killed. I say this on Divine Mercy Sunday. What kind of image of God is that? That he wants violence. Hmm? Crucifixion. Piercing. I want to put my hand on his side. Where they, you know, poked him with, his, with the spear. He pierced his hand. Bleeding. On the cross. Dying on the cross like a dog. What kind of God wants such violence? This is not the image of the divine mercy. It's not the image of God. The image of the divine mercy is the God who took this catastrophe wrecked by unbelieving humans like us, took it, the crucifixion and death of his only beloved son, took it and created the most amazing event in our human history out of it. That is the image and the power of God. Humans are the ones who crucified Jesus. He gave us free will. We exercised it. When he sent his son, we refused to listen. But he took that. He created the defeat of death itself out of it. He created eternal life out of this catastrophe that befell his son. This is the power, this is the message of Easter. That if God can take this, hmm, this you, we have no idea what the crucifixion is. It's, the, it's a Roman way of saying you're not a human being. And there is the crucifixion is reserved for people who rebel against Roman authority. Mm -hmm. So they crucify you to say this person who is saying we have no right to occupy this territory. It's not even a human being. You know, it's dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. So if God can take this catastrophic event and create salvation out of it, how much more coronavirus? How much more the pain and the suffering that and death that we experience in life in our world today? How much more? Can God not take this and transform it and give us the song of Hallelujah and give us that Easter grace that we're still celebrating? But for this to happen, I think we are called. Easter is a great celebration, but I don't think Easter is just about singing Hallelujah. That's a beautiful Hallelujah uh, song you sang there. The glory. But I think Easter is also a time for us to join in that bodice, that path, that way that Jesus followed, so that our experience of the crucifixion is seen in the light, with the eyes, with the mind, with the attitude of Jesus. And I don't just mean this theoretically. Let me just zero in on one aspect of this. Uh, the way Jesus, the hurdles, that path that Jesus took, the way Jesus suffered and died. Mm -hmm. By the way, he didn't have to die that way. Jesus could have lived to old age, mm -hmm. 99, like Prince Philip. Mm -hmm. He just died. Jesus could have lived. I Maybe mean, he would have come to Africa. Mm -hmm. Or Jesus could have you know, died in his sleep. When he's still dead. Could have, when the, the, the storm was blowing out of the boat, could have, they could have drowned. Still dead. You know? Or when he was riding on the mule of the, the donkey to Jerusalem, could have been assassinated. You know? So great leaders have been assassinated. John Kennedy and, you know, um, or Samara Machel. We've had many great leaders in Africa who've emerged to serve their people, and they were assassinated. So Jesus could have been assassinated. So why this particular way of dying? I've been thinking about this you know, since Lent and through Easter. Why this, what I, I, I like to call the scapegoating, the scapegoating and the suffering of an innocent person. Scapegoating, suffering and death of an innocent person. Why this particular 
form of death that God allowed. I think it is the sin of the world. Scapegoating suffering of the innocent person is the sin of the world. Genesis has a you know beautiful imagery, you know, Adam and Eve eating the, the fruit, you know, the apple in the garden. It's, it's, it's a beautiful image. But when you look, you know, you look at human history, if there is one sin that has caused all the suffering, all the death, all the catastrophe, the violence, the misery in this world. It is this, scapegoating the suffering and death of the innocent. You can go back to slavery. You come take millions of people, you ship them off. Who will never see their homeland again. What have those people done? Nothing. Nothing, they, they were just on their right and took them. As the scapegoating the suffering and death of the innocent. You take colonialism, you come to a land, a nation, and you say, okay, this land now belongs to me. Okay, if you don't like it. And of course, Jesus' own country was colonized. The irony is that they, his own people handed him over to the colonizers to be killed. But you know, Jesus' country was colonized as well. And this has caused chaos. People lose their sense of identity, lose their language, they lose their culture. The scapegoating, the suffering and death of the innocent. I can go on and on and give you examples of how this continues to happen, how this is responsible for all the problems we have today in the world. We see it even in religious communities. Just pick on, if you ask this person, this brother or this sister, what has this person done to you? If you listen to that, you, you will not find it. No, there's no reason, there's no reason on a good, cogent, truthful reason why they put on that person. You won't find them. And these are people who say they've given their lives to Christ, to God. Mm -hmm. So even you know, in, among us, you know, religious and priests, it's happening. Scapegoat is the same thing. Scapegoating suffering you know, of the innocent. For those of you, uh, uh, Francis, you worked in a school. Mm -hmm. Go to school, even primary school. You see the two children there. You know, this is why I said this must be the original sin. You see, the two children are not supposed to be innocent. They come to school, they'll pick one person in the class, and they will bully that person. They will all hate the person. That child has not done them anything whatsoever. They just, and they're enjoying it. You say, where did they learn this? The same thing. Scapegoating the suffering the death of the innocent is the path that God allowed to be the path of our salvation. So the project of Easter then, my friends, is to overcome our own experience of this. Everybody has experienced this, unless you are the ones scapegoating people or torturing them. Otherwise, everybody has at some point in his or her life experience this scapegoating and unjust suffering. The transformative power of Easter then is to take the attitude of Jesus when you have this experience. So briefly, what did Jesus do? Oh, Jesus did, did not say, oh dear, amen. the one I gave the keys to the kingdom has denied me three times. Even the one that I gave the key to the person, the betrayer, has uh, betrayed me with my own people, the chief priests and Pharisees are hanging me over. Jesus did not play the victim. Just if you watch the, all the, the, the uh, crucifixion story. He did not play the victim. Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Is Jesus not allowing his heart of love to be changed by the actions? of others, by the evil, by the scapegoating, by the suffering, and the unjust and eventually death that he experienced. He did not change his heart. That's when he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. That is divine mercy right there. 
no matter what your experience may be, you cannot allow the image of God given to you, the heart of love, the pure goodness that God has implanted in you, you cannot allow another person to change it. It's a double tragedy. This is why God took that event, suffering and death of Jesus innocently and transformed it and out of it created the greatest victory of all time overcoming death, gaining eternal life. So if we, my brothers and my sisters, are going to experience the Easter peace, the breath of the Spirit that Jesus passed on today, we too must take on the heart and the attitude of Christ. It is that heart and attitude that is the divine mercy. That's why we are all here today. Because of that heart of God. And I pray for each of us that we experience this Easter grace. It's a, it's a very specific grace of Easter. I pray that we experience it. My brothers and my sisters, if you get it, your life will not be the same. No amount of suffering, no amount of evil that people may inflict on you, that the world may inflict on you, will take away the peace of the risen Jesus when he appears, as he did in today's gospel. Say, peace be with you. May we claim that peace, that with equanimity, we can go through these difficult times that we are in. And as people who have been called by God to be a source of Easter hope for so many people, we too can be a source of that peace to all those that we are called to serve. Can we go and meet our families? They will tell us about Corona, about the poverty, about the suffering, about the insecurity. They will tell us all these problems. But we will not have money or anything to bring, but we will have the grace of the Easter peace to give to them. And that is a peace that nothing can take away. May God give us this grace. May God give us this peace. May God help us to experience that breath of the Spirit that Jesus gave us today through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.